And I would suggest to you that the reason they did that was that they very well knew that if they were apprehended at that point in the operation, the only basis they would have for claiming POW status rather than unlawful combatant status was the fact that they were in uniform and followed a recognized chain of command and at least could argue that they should be detained rather than executed. Um, as it happens, when they were picked up, they were in civvies. Um, and they were tried, uh, convicted. They were tried on direct order of President Roosevelt before a military commission sitting in the United States, um, convicted, um, executed, and their appeals heard within three months. Indeed, the opinion in the case, uh, ex parte Quirin, was issued um, after they were already deceased. Um, we're not that quick today. <laughs> Yes. Uh, uh, General, as I understand it, uh, at the end of uh, your term, uh, the policy of the Justice Department uh, in matters involving foreign intelligence was to gather intelligence against the threat rather than necessarily against particular individuals who may be part of the threat. Uh, if the current administration is reversing that and going back to the law enforcement model, do you, do you foresee that they're going to uh, expressly change that intelligence gathering policy as well? Well, um, I'm having a hard time with the concept of gathering intelligence against a threat as opposed to particular individuals. There are always particular individuals involved. When you gather, when you listen to a conversation, it's a conversation between people um, and generally you have reason for believing that one or both um, is engaged in, um, uh, in activity that threatens the security of the country. Otherwise, given the relatively small manpower, person power, I should say, um, uh, devoted to this effort, uh, it would be a colossal waste of time to listen to anything else. Um, so I think that um, they, they, they continue to gather intelligence um, against the threat. The question is, what, if anything, they do with it? Yes? Uh, Judge, in, in your practical view, how do you think the court would manage uh, the voir dire process to find a jury that A, is fair and unbiased in the Southern District of New York, and B, hadn't had any news coverage of uh, these particular individuals? Um, that's, well, um, as it happens, I did it um, in a case involved, involving a trial relating to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. And that part actually um, isn't all that difficult, provided that the standards are followed. Um, they don't have to have been comatose um, for the last 10 years in order to serve on a jury or never to have heard of the case. What they have to be able to do is to promise that they will decide the case based only on the evidence presented in the courtroom and not what they hear on the outside. Um, and there has to be good reason to believe that they will fulfill that promise. Um, and jurors like that can be found. That part of the process um, I have great faith in. Um, it's the rest of it that worries me. Yes? Judge, I believe it's John Darbyshire who's just come out with a book reminding us conservatives that we need to remain gloomy and dismal. And I, I assure you that I, I try to follow that advice. <laughs> what, easier, what, easier some days than others. And, and some administrations than others. What, in all seriousness, uh, what advice, uh, hope, or counsel can you you give those of us who become increasingly dismayed at what we see coming out of the current administration in, in what uh, truly is an existential fight for the future of this country and the Western way of life. Look, I think um, articulating what your eyes and ears tell you um, and what your common sense tell you, tells you um, is the best and only way to fight fair. Um, and uh, if you do it, against people who are making an argument that is based on a refusal to face facts, and then you're likely to prevail. Um, I say you. I, I should add that one of the, um, one of the benefits of, of leaving public service is that I got to become a member of this organization, so I should say we rather than you. <laughs> And I, I, w I want to hasten to add, I don't mean to criticize public servants, including judges, who are in fact members of this organization. I just felt uncomfortable belonging to it when I was on the bench and when I was attorney general, and so I didn't. But um, great, to be, great to be here. I should add also that if I had to be in any venue today 
um, after what was announced this morning. Um, I'm glad it's this one. <laughs> General McKay, could you speak to the decision whether it's defensible to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in the Southern District of New York versus the choice of the Eastern District of Virginia, which obviously Zacharias Musawi was tried in for the same conspiracy, versus the Western District of Pennsylvania and the differing jury pools you might get there, as well as the courtroom facilities? Um, I understand. I am a partisan of the Southern District of New York. Um, <laughs> I know of no jurisdiction where you can get uh, people who are better prepared to deal with it, and that includes prosecutors, judges, and jurors. Um, I am not aware of precisely enough of the facilities in the Eastern District of Virginia or the, is it the Middle District of Pennsylvania or the Western? I'm not sure. Right. Um, but en enough to make a comparison. Um, but saying that if you have to do it any place, it's a good place to do it. Yes, there's venue in all three places. Um, saying that if you have to do it any place, that is a place to do it, is not the same by any means and shouldn't be construed by anybody as my saying that that's what I think should be done, because obviously it isn't. Yes? Judge, what do you think this means for the military commissions going forward? Because it, it seemed like for a while that the president was interested in interested in using the military commissions, and now is he signaling that he won't use them now? Um, <laughs> if, if I had the gift of clairvoyance, um, which I don't, um, I could answer that, although I don't know that even if I could discern the intent now, that it would be the same as the intent as announced before, or the intent as it will appear tomorrow. Um, <laughs> My speech, as I said, had a certain improvisational quality. Um, I think that the policies that have been announced and adopted with regard to what we've been talking about have also have a certain improvisational quality. <laughs> Judge, this morning, Attorney General Holder responded to a question about whether this opens the door now for these cases being thrown out on a procedural technicality, and either with defects in evidence or the procedure itself. Um, and Attorney General Holder's response was basically that we shouldn't worry about that because he's seen things we haven't seen and that's just not going to happen. I was wondering if you could comment a bit on whether that's an appropriate answer given the severity of the charges here and whether we should be really in a time that people are questioning whether or not they like this evidence at all, especially people in the current administration. We should trust their judgment that this is just going to be okay. Well, um, I don't know what he's seen, so I can't, I can't very well respond to um, his level of confidence. Um, I have been a judge, and I'm more to the point I've spoken to a whole lot of other judges, and um, betting the farm on the outcome of that process is, is always involves a risk. Um, the Speedy Trial Act, um, which applies to Mr. Galani, who was indicted, um, I believe, back in, back in, in, in the 90s, if not 2000, um, is going to interfere in some, to some extent. I mean, there's already a motion to dismiss based on a Speedy Trial Act violation. Now, whether the remedy here would be outright dismissal or simply permission to the government to bring the charges again uh, because of something that is seen as an overriding circumstance, it's like sense, I can't tell you. But um, it is one government, and he was in custody um, at least since 2004. Um, this is five years later. Um, the um, the period of time provided for in the Speedy Trial Act is 90 days, less excludable time. Um, there, are going to be, there are going to be legal problems. Um, the same, I don't know whether the same will hold true with respect to, that is, the, leak, the Speedy Trial Act issues, will hold true with respect to those who have not yet been indicted uh, in connection with, um, that is, in the civilian courts in connection with the Trade Center bombing. Um, but I suppose I could see an argument that says that, look, we were charged before a military commission in Guantanamo with that. Um, it's one government, and um, we're entitled to a, we were entitled to a speedy trial. 